All right, so welcome everyone. Um, you are at the Silicon Valley Reads program, Birding in Your Backyard, hashtag bird the feck at home. This is part of Silicon Valley Reads, uh, which is an annual community program that encourages a love of reading and learning. Um, and this year's theme is connecting. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being broadcast to Facebook Live. So if you have any technical difficulties with Zoom, you can head over to the Santa Clara County Library District's Facebook page and watch it there. And um, that's also somewhere you can watch this recording um, after the event is over. Uh, it is being recorded. However, as an attendee, um, neither your video or audio is available. Um, so your image will not be being recorded. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A below and we'll try to get to all of those. We'll have a Q&A at the end of the event. And um, we'll try to also keep an eye out in the Facebook comments at Santa Clara County Library District's Facebook page. Um, we apologize if we run out of time and aren't able to get to all of the questions. Uh, so that's it. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Cynthia to get us started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Silicon Valley Reads Bird the Feck at Home program. Um, I know you're expecting Bruce and Ed. Obviously, I'm not Bruce. And believe me, nobody is sorrier that Bruce couldn't be here than I am. Um, I got pulled into the last minute to keep Ed company while we do the event, so uh, I'll do my best. Um, uh, Bruce is safe and well, though, so no worries. And I'm going to uh, let Ed tell why he's not here, because it's such a bird nerd thing. Um, but first, uh, why, am, why am I here? Um, I'm Cynthia. I'm the supervising librarian at the Los Altos Library, now retired. And last fall, I was asked if I had any ideas for bird programs uh, that would support our Silicon Valley Reads event and that we could do in connection with um, J. Drew Lanham's The Home Place, which is one of our books for this year. So I have been a member of Bird the Feck at Home since May, and I thought um, I've never experienced anything that speaks more to community and connection around a love of nature than this group. Um, Ed is such a rock star for founding this and keeping it going in the harmonious and very fun loving way that it is. Um, so when I pitched the program to Ed and Bruce, I was so happy when they agreed to take part. So that's why I'm here and that's why Ed's here. And so I want to give a very big welcome to Ed Williams. How are you today, Ed? Yeah, good, good. Thanks. And it's um, uh, a real shame that Bruce couldn't be be here because I think it, it would have been uh, really great having him on. Plus, I, I feel like a bit of a fraud because, you know, this is Silicon Valley Reads and I only write um, posts on Facebook, so it's not really up there. Whereas Bruce has recently published a um, book, An Australian Birding Year, based on um, a, a year that, that spanned 2015, 2016, um, where he and his wife um, got in a, a little camper van that they named Troopy and traveled for a year all around this wonderful continent of Australia, um, ostensibly to see as many different kinds of Australian birds as he could, but it's a, a wonderful story about life and the pressures of doing these crazy things and, and all the other things that, that surround you in a year as, as, well, as, as well as the birds. Sadly, um, he isn't here because um, of 2020, rolling into 2021 in the sense that um, we've had a mini lockdown for a COVID outbreak in, in Melbourne. And he unfortunately was due to fly back from Queensland yesterday where he was up there looking for a, um, a Nordman's green shank. So um, for the birders on there, you'll know that's a, a very special shorebird that um, is sought after, normally seen in, in Asia, very rarely seen anywhere else and um, very few in Australia. And for the non-birders on the court, it looks exactly the same as every other bird pecking around in the mud. So um, so sadly, he, he can't be here, but he um, did send his best wishes. And um, for, for the audience that's the over in the US, his book is coming out in April. It's published by John Boyfoy. It's already sold its first run in Australia. And um, particularly in these times where we can't travel, you know, having read it, it is a, it's a lovely way of just traveling around another continent from from your own armchair so uh thoroughly recommended there yes and uh for our local silicon valley audience we do have the book on order for the santa clara county library district so just go in the catalog and you can get um you can put place a hold on it also devon has emailed a couple of uh recommended reading lists we came up with in connection with 
the nature aspect of Silicon Valley Reads, and it's listed on that as well. So before we start talking about the phenomenon that is Bird the Feck at Home, um, Ed, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm originally from, from the UK. I've uh, um, born and bred in Manchester, but um, moved to Australia, um, must be 14 years ago now. So uh, I met my now wife, who's Australian, back in the UK, and then we took the decision all those years ago that um, to move move over to Australia, see, see what the sun looks like, for example, and because uh, you, you don't get a lot of that in Coventry where we're living at the time. And uh, um, we spent four years in Sydney and then we moved down to, to Melbourne where she's originally from and we've been here for the last 10 years now. Um, and the, uh, the photo we used for publicity shows your two adorable children. Are they yes. budding expert birders? Um, yes, yes, they, 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 they absorb it through osmosis. And I think they, they like the impressive things, you know, the sort of the eagles and the, the owls and things like that. And they like knowing things that other people don't know. So if they see a little black and white bird that someone says is a baby magpie, they'll go, no, it's actually a baby, it's a magpie lark. But, um, you know, um, yeah, it's, Hugh is eight and um, Elise is five. And, uh, you know, we've, um, we, we enjoy going out, particularly during, during the sort of the lockdown we've been in over the last year, just to sort of explore the local, local sort of area has, has, been, has been a lot of fun. And, um, and they've really enjoyed that. Good. So what are some of the differences between birding in Australia and the UK? Um, a, it's, um, there's a lot more birds in Australia and there's a lot less birders. So the UK um, is probably the birdiest place on earth. The, the, the main charity body, the RSPB, um, the equivalent of Audubon, has a million members. Um, the number of reserves is phenomenal and, you know, it, it's, it's a really big thing. Everybody feeds in, in the backyard. In Australia, it's um, despite the more, you know, definitely more impressive and, and more dramatic birds. Um, I think partly the nature of the birds means people don't feed them and partly just the distance is covered. So there's a, there's a, a big bird loving community, but I'd say less, less of the sort of the hardcore bird community that you've got in the UK and, and, and the US as well. And have you had the opportunity to bird in the US before? Yes, um, I was really lucky. Um, two years ago, I came to the US for a couple of um, business trips and, you know, both spanned weekends as well. So I sort of got out and about and um, uh, the, the two parts of the, the country I visited were California and Philadelphia. Um, got a good friend up in Philly, um, Tony Crosdale, who who took me out up to the Pocono Mountains up there. And, and you know, we had, had some stuff there. And then uh I sort of headed out around the Bay Area and um, I, uh, I looked on, on eBird, which is the sort of software for tracking what you've seen. And uh, Santa Clara County, I've actually seen exactly 100 species of birds. So uh, um, it was uh, it's, great. It's, yeah, it's, it's nice to uh, know a few of the birds that you've got in your own, your own backyards there. Yep. And um, how did you get started birding? Um, I, I don't know. I guess I've always loved birds from... A, a, a really young age I mean my mum and dad used to to feed feed the birds in the backyard um we uh um I remember they used to for example hang bacon rind up in the the apple tree for the the magpies to come down and eat and we had you know you'd hang coconuts for the blue tits and um they also used to peck through in the old days you know I'm, sh I'm showing my age well, when we had milk the milkman used to drop the milk bottles off at the front front doorstep with little silver silver foil caps and then the blue tits would fly down and peck holes through the silver foil caps to eat the cream so uh it's uh, a, a lost era now sadly but uh you yeah, know I mean it just all and, and all, all nature not just birds I think birds are more visible but you know especially when in, in somewhere now like in Australia just you know all the, the mammals and reptiles and everything else that's out there as well. It's just phenomenal. Okay, so Bird the Feck at Home. Um, how and why did this get started? Um, what gave you the idea and what did you hope to accomplish? Um, why and how, you know, so I guess why was first, um, there, was, there was three things that, and we're going back to March last year, which is less than a year ago, but feels like 
centuries um <laughs> the way that the last year has been and everything's gone on uh, effectively there was there was three things very much um part of it was wanting to to flatten the curve particularly in those early days when when the virus was sort of first beginning to spread um and you know i was quite active online within the sort of birding community in australia and i thought well what can we do that encourages people to enjoy what they've got in in their backyard um second reason was uh as in any group of people in walk of life unfortunately there are there are idiots um and there was some bad press going out um both in the uk and in ohio at the time where birders were going off during lockdown breaking rules to chase you know to, to go and tick another bird uh for their ohio list or for their west midlands uk list or, or whatever um and thirdly i guess i just needed a distraction because we were sort of and i, I assume it's probably the same in california this this sort of feeling of impending doom that was sweeping across the world in in february and march last year in terms of lockdowns and economy and you know spending far too long scrolling through the phone reading horrific statistics about what was going on in italy and spain and iran and china and I, I just sort of thought, hold on, I need a distraction as well. And I thought, well, how, how can I do something that combines all, all, all these things? And so I basically set up this group um, and, uh, you know, set up it on Facebook. I've never set any, any group up on Facebook before, so I was a complete novice. Um, and, um, you know, invited all my friends, primarily in Australia, um, in, in the burning community but also there was um a few from the us i've made from my, my trip there and um a few back in the uk and basically just said hey everyone let's uh see if we can see if we can find as many different backyard birds as we can and and it's one of those things that it just took off i mean it, it was it's definitely an organic beast there was no strategy or planning behind it it was more i obviously struck struck the right chord with the right group of people at the time and everyone was inviting you know all their friends along and and before i knew it we'd, we'd had you know even within a within a few days we had hundreds and hundreds of members joining from dozens of countries and and it was a it became a a great distraction and a safe place for so many people around the world with a like-minded horror of covid and a like-minded love of birds and i think it was a it was a great way of connecting this community together in that sense Yes, yeah, so 11 months in, how many members are there by now? Um, we've passed 8,300, I believe, at the moment. So it's, um, wow. which is is particularly good because you, um, in the sense that it's a, we keep it a private group. We don't want to sort of get every every single person in the world coming in and um, then you get the bots and the spam and all these kind of things. So, you know, the post can't be can't be public and therefore it, it's grown much bigger than I thought. And But in a manageable way as well, because again, there's a danger if you, you go from zero to 100,000 members in in, in a, a few weeks, you can't keep up and the whole thing implodes. Yeah. So how many countries do we have by now, uh, do you know? So on the actual, um, so says, I don't know how many countries we have members from exactly, um, around about 140, um, because Facebook statistics stop at 100 and we, we, oh. we know that. we. We've got sightings, so so the, the core behind it, for, for those that aren't familiar, is we basically have this thing we call the master list where people from around the world let us know what they've seen and we collect them all into one giant group list of birds. Now we've got 129 countries as we speak who have actually not just joined the group but have also submitted sightings and got those sightings on. On top of that, there's also countries that have joined that we haven't got new birds from because we only put each time each time you find a bird, you only get it on there once. So the first person to get a, um, you know, a, a California scrub jay or something, they will be the that that that's the country that gets it. So so the US would get that. So if um, another country gets the same bird, they don't add it. So we've also got as well as 129 countries that have added the birds on there we know we've got members in in other countries like um off the top of my head afghanistan algeria cameroon ireland turkey who haven't been able to get new new birds on the list but you know are there so that's where the guess of about 140 possibly even 150 countries comes from yeah so the last time i looked i think last night we were within 50 of reaching 5,000. 
Are, are yes, we there so yet? <laughs> the answer is probably. And the reason is um, we're, we're sitting at 4,985. Wow. Um, which blows my mind, you know. Um, the reason I say we're probably already at, at 5,000 is because I have at least seven more to add from Kenya. This is my new life. I have all these messages that shoot around. I have a list of 50 birds from a backyard in West Papua um, that I need to check. Um, and I know some of them are definitely going to be new um, just because I had a scan down and two of them jumped out. And I've also been told I'm going to get a list from the Central African Republic today. So um, I'm assuming between those three, there will be at least 15 more, um, which just blows my mind. I mean, you know, the idea that 5,000 different species of bird um, can be found in people's backyards that we've we've connected to it is just um, a, a phenomenal result, really. Yeah. And just to jump in for people who have not joined the group yet, um, first of all, you must. Um, and second, I think there are only two rules. Uh, all the birds that are listed or counted need to be seen from your backyard or from your yard. Um, and the other rule is to be nice. They're two pretty, mm. pretty easy rules, but uh, just wanted to insert that. So um, did you envision something this big or this successful when you started? Absolutely, absolutely not. I mean, I certainly didn't envisage myself 11 months later, you know, chatting at a Silicon Valley Reads event. Which, um, so um, I, I don't know, we, we, you know, I was, I was winging it a bit originally and it was basically, um, I set the target of a thousand. I thought that was ambitious, but, but doable. Um, Cause I figured, you know, we could probably get two or 300 in Australia and, you know, get a get hundred from Europe and a couple of hundred from the U S and then hopefully someone will know someone in some, some other place. Um, so, you know, and as we grew and I thought, well, now we've hit a thousand, maybe 2000 is possible, but that's getting ambitious, but certainly until we get to 4,000, there's, there's no chance that we'd even consider 5,000. And it's just, um, it's been amazing how it's kept spreading and the momentum's kept going. And, and so far, it, it, it sort of hasn't burned itself out in that sense that we're still adding records thick and fast from, from all over the planet, which, um, which, is really, which is really heartening considering that, as I say, a core of the membership now in um, the US and Australia, so probably 60% of our members are, are either based in the US or Australia. Most of them really can't add any more birds because we've, we've added, I think, almost, I'd say probably 98% of the birds that are possible in, in the US and probably 96% in, in Australia. So you've got to have a pretty special special backyard in those places now um, to, to be adding anything, or you've got to have an absolute fluke that something just happens to pass through on migration or something. Yeah, and we're all looking for those. Um, <laughs> but when you started, did you have like a measurement of success in mind? Like uh, if we get a thousand birds, yeah. I can a stop thousand. or 50 countries, I can go on and do something else or? Uh, not really. I think it was more, a thousand birds was a success. It was like, if, if we can get people on here and we can, we can get a thousand birds added, that's a success. But there was no particular end game because I guess the, the beauty of um, birds and, and nature is, it's, it, it, the options are unlimited really. And therefore, ultimately, you know, when there's over 10,000 species, I think, according to the list we've got, and scientists argue till they're blue in the face over this, we, we classify 10,770 species of different birds that are still existent on the planet. Um, so that ultimately, it, you know, until we've got 10,770, we've still got things to look for. But um, it's like a computer game in the sense that every time you get a bird, you go up a level and it gets harder. Um, so all the all the easy ones are, are long gone, but um, you know, to me, we, we carry on. And whilst, whilst, and as I've said, whilst anyone's locked down in the world, and and it's not just what happens in Melbourne or Australia, but it's what happens in India and South Africa and Colombia. You know, whilst we've got people who are confined to their backyards, we we're going to carry on and uh, look for as many birds as we can. So this must be a huge amount of work. Are you doing this all by yourself? Absolutely not. I'm actually really glad you asked this question because um, the the work comes from two two groups of people. Really, first of all, I've got the best admin team out there in in, in Facebook. They are so full of good ideas. They're so helpful. Um, the good new the, the good thing about it is we 
you know, we, we got people in the different time zones. So, you know, we've got, um, you know, an admin, core admin team that originally came from Australia because of the, the nature where the group came from. We've got several admin in Africa and also in North America, including in California. Um, and it just, it's great because A, it gives um, different perspectives, but B, it means we've sort of got 24 hours um, around the clock. And within that team, we've got really talented people, some who are really good on the technical side. And, you know, if the sheet gets broken, because we have a, a Google sheet where people can go on and, and, and add the sightings to, we've got other people who have made it their mission to, to find certain species or, or invite certain people. And, you know, some of the some of the backyards we've got of uh, redefined the concept of backyard, again, thanks to, to some of the some of the admin team. Um, and then secondly, is it's the membership. I mean, if this was me, um, we'd have 30 birds on the list, you know, I'd have a, uh, you know, minor birds and starlings and, and pigeons and, you know, for, for Americans, the, the cockatoos and the rainbow lorikeets might be exciting, but, but there's really nothing of, nothing of drama in my backyard. And so it's the members who are getting involved, who uh, both by reporting their own birds and very much inviting other people um, that have really, you know, made this made this the sort of the group that it is and and I often kind of feel a bit of a fraud in the sense that I get all the, the plaudits and and a lot of the praise of, of this whole group and really it, it without without that core admin team behind me and without the great membership it's just me ranting at a computer about common starlings and, and common miners so so it, it really is a, a, a wonderful team effort um, and also on top of that, with other other sort of bird groups have been quite welcoming and helpful. And you know, for example, this week we've had the we've had a, a what we call Africa Week, where we've sort of focused on trying to get some more birds from Africa. And the African Bird Club, which is sort of a a birders club that looks after the sort of birding interests of the, the whole of continental Africa, they've been really welcoming, and they've sort of found us new members. Um, and um, so, so it's just it's been a lovely collective um, of of people across the sort of this birdie community, um, yeah. and it fits beautifully with that um, the theme of Silicon Valley Reads of connecting because it you know it's been all about connecting all, all these all these great people from from across the globe. Yeah, and what a great segue to my next question, which is, uh, so the theme is connecting the universal human ability to build resilience by looking for people places and things that provide comfort and joy during tough times. So how do you think Bird the Feck at Home embodies this theme of community and connecting? Well, I think the the, the three words you, you used sort of in that people, places and things absolutely is what Bird the Feck at Home is about. The things are obviously the birds. The places are all those amazing places around the planet that we've, we've got um, those birds in and of course the people we've spoken to that one of the one of the lovely things about this group has been that um it's been probably the most positive place i've, I've i'm not saying this because it's my group because you know that's that, that's 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 not the case but um it's just been a really positive vibe on the group and a, a really welcoming you know and, and of all the sort of woes and pains of social media particularly in 2020 with with all the things going on politically um, and pandemically around the planet. Um, you know, we, we've been lucky that we've had such a, such a, such a nice thing, but, um, and, and, and connecting is what it's all about. If you think about it, it, it was, I set up this, this group connected with the people that I knew who connected with the people they knew and, and so on. And it, and it, it spread around the planet a bit like COVID, but a kind of an anti-COVID. It yes. was this this nice um <laughs> this nice thing that was spreading around the globe and and you know um sort of connecting people and 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 it has been wonderful because you know a year later it, it it has sort of set up this uh genuine community where it amazes me now how many of my friends online have suddenly got friends online who are oh they know them from from Bird the Fag at home and you know this year for example the birthday greetings I got from on, online because it was my birthday last week um you know I was getting birthday greetings from places like Tristan da Cunha and Ethiopia and you know all, all these places all around the world and it, it sort of blows your mind how 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 this community has connected and it, it's been a, a real great thing and that's when when you sort of invited me to come and speak to this and explain what the theme was I thought well 
it, it apart from the fact that I haven't written a book and therefore I'm a fraud in a reading thing um it's a it's a a, a great a great topic and something that you know close to my heart to speak about really yeah well you don't have to be an author to speak to Silicon Valley reads just um so I'm wondering though when you started the group did you envision this kind of community developing or did you think it would just be more a group of people who got together to compare lists and how why do you I, think it became this community or how? I hoped it, I hoped it would become this community in the sense that um my style has always been to be quite irreverent and relaxed I'm, I'm not one of the stereo stereotypical really serious birders that that you know get upset if you if you use the wrong technical term or or um you know have very very strict rigid rules um which are some some facebook groups are but at the other end of the scale as well i didn't want it to become the kind of um uh, how cute look at the fluffy little chick kind of group that you also get on Facebook at the other you know uh, what I wanted was a, a proper group for proper birders but but one that was welcoming to to beginners and um just a fun place to be where we've got this overriding theme of we're here to try and find as many birds as we can on on the planet but if we just did that it would be pretty dry and very niche and what we wanted somewhere that people just pop in as and when they wanted and um one of the members from from up in Queensland described it really nicely as he felt it was like the pub he could pop into during lockdown but mm. a pub that was full of you know nice friendly nice friendly staff and nice friendly um customers and and that's what we kind of so we've got this underlying theme this this spine as it were of we're looking for sightings and we're going to you know try and get as many different records of birds and and we're, we're collecting countries as well we, we love getting new countries so you know it's, it's the you know the, the listing inbuilt sort of bird nerd side to us but um but somewhere where you know you can have people who are real global experts and, and, and the beautiful thing is we've got some real top birding experts there um along with people who have joined the group because their friend likes it and they know nothing about birds and they they've stayed and enjoyed it and to me that that's what it should be about it that it should it shouldn't be about just an elitism you know it should be a, a place where you know the great and the good of the birding world um of, we, of which we have some can mingle shoulder to shoulder with people who you know are happy because they've just did their first you know house finch or something like that and, and, yeah. and that's what i want it's that that sort of that mix Good. So what's been your favorite part of this adventure so far? Um, do you have any birds that stand out or countries? It, it's really hard. I mean, when you when you've had 5000 birds in 129 countries, it is really difficult to, to pull out a favorite thing. I think that um, I'll, I'll, I'll pull out a couple and by doing so, I'm doing massive injustice to, to everybody else and all the other birds that we've had. The shoe bill is obviously a bird of legend. Um, for those who don't know a shoe bill, um, after after this event, please go on Google and check it out because it is, if if Jim Henson could invent a bird, this is it. I mean, it is the most ridiculous bird. To add the the, the reason that it was so sought after is not only does it look amazing with this you know this big Dutch wooden clog as its um as its bill and its huge great big sort of distant relative of the stork. Um, but it lives only in very isolated deep swamps in Africa in a very limited number of countries sort of around Zambia and then up in up in Uganda and, and Rwanda and so a getting this and it's very rare as well as sadly not many left in the world so the idea of being able to to find a very hard to see bird anyway in a very rural distant part of Africa and then be able to find someone who can classify it as their backyard was was incredibly difficult and uh to do so um you know showed how much we'd we'd, we'd grown and, and we we got one in fact in the end i think we ended up with two or possibly even three different people who who were lucky enough to have these these um african swamplands in their backyards that blew my mind um in terms of the most impressive location um I, I, again i don't want to spec 
to, to, to every, everywhere special. And that's the beauty of it. But I think probably in a way, the Trist, Tristan de Kuna Islands and Tristan de Kuna blew my mind the most. So again, for those who don't know Tristan de Kuna, um, it's a tiny um, uh, archipelago, of four islands, um, three of them that are uninhabited deep down in the in the far south of the Atlantic Ocean, um, a population of around about seven or 800 people um, and equidistant from South America and um, Africa, um, South, South Africa. And um, we were lucky enough to get um, someone join the group from, from there, um, Kelly, who posted some of the, the most isolated and, and rarest birds on the planet. I mean, we, you know, to get the Tristan Thrush, I mean, just to, to get to Tristan Skinner, you, know, you cannot fly there. You have to fly to South Africa and then you have to get a boat for about 10 days um, to, to, to get in, in some of the roughest seas in the world. Um, but then offshore from Tristan to, to Kuna, there's three other islands, um, one further down, Gough Island, um, and then Nightingale Island, an inaccessible island. Um, we got um, through another member, Andy from, from the RSPB, who's been an absolute champion in getting us these crazy places. Um, we then got scientists who were living and working on, on Nightingale Island and on Gough Island where albatrosses um, breed in the thousands. And it's just, a, a, again, amazing places to get to. But then the last one was impossible. Um, inaccessible Island, um, you guess by the name is inaccessible. So. Once you get to Tristan de Kuna, which is already a difficult in itself, you then have to sail across um, to uh, 30 k's across to an accessible island. There is only one small beach on the entire island that you can get onto. And apparently you can only get onto that beach for maybe two weeks a year. Um, last year in 2020, there wasn't a human being who stepped foot on it during the pandemic. So. However hard we tried, we could not count that someone's backyard because, you know, if someone isn't living there, it is in the backyard. But we, we were lucky enough that, that our group, the word had spread so that when the scientists who are now on Inaccessible Island were going, um, they, they knew about us and um, basically as soon as they got, got there, set up the tent, um, saw birds, the Inaccessible Finch and the Inaccessible Rail, um, which are probably two of the hardest birds in the world to, to possibly find. And because they're spending two or three months there removing invasive plants, because sadly, even somewhere as remote as that is touched by, by, the, bad side of, by, by the bad side of the sort of human spread. And um, they're, they're removing New Zealand flax there. And, and so that became that backyard. I mean, if, if you're living somewhere for, for a couple of months and, and, and the, the little rails were actually climbing inside their tent. So, there's no dispute that the bit of the island that, that they were living on had the birds That's that we were looking for. And, yeah. and, and just the idea of having spread from, you know, the backyards of Melbourne and Philadelphia and, and North Wales through to, you know, one of the hardest and most legendary places on earth to get to, particularly from a bird nerd perspective, you know, the inaccessible rail is the Holy Grail. Um, perhaps we should call it the inaccessible grail, but, um, uh, is, is amazing to get and so I guess that's the place I would I would mention but to be honest there's so many places I mean Belize just the way the community in Belize has, has taken us on it's a small country but we've got hundreds of members who've been such a joy you know people in the mountains of Bhutan um you know Papua New Guinea and all the all the even a country say let's take the USA the, the fact that we, we got the USA, but we've we've got the the, the Farallons and and um, you know Midway Atoll and and the Aleutian Islands and and uh, Santa Cruz with the scrub jay and mm -hmm. you know all, all not just it's not just what country have we got, but it's where have we we got to within these countries, and it's just it's just been a I mean it, it it's been for me one big geography lesson um it's, yeah. it's been fantastic i've been discovering all these all these places around the world that I, I may have heard of but didn't know much about and to have real people that you're engaging with and talking with from all these places is, is just it's, it's been fantastic yeah so bringing it back a little bit more local um 
I know in the United States, there have been articles and people have been observing, uh, a lot more people have been taking up bird watching as a hobby since COVID. People are stuck at home, they're noticing things that they had never noticed before, and they're uh, kind of getting into it, uh, which is great. Um, has Australia experienced the same thing, do you think? I think so. I think um, uh, certainly from a um, perspective is that every year they have something called the, the Big Backyard Bird Count, which is run by BirdLife Australia, um, it's the main bird conservation charity over here. And certainly this year's um, event was by far the biggest they've ever had, which I think is the, the, the best measure effectively is more Australians than ever looking at the birds and, and reporting them back. Um, and, you know, it's, it's great for, for engaging the community like that. I also think that um, there's been a little bit more in the way of press coverage and interest and, um, you know, people sort of asking themselves what's, what's, what's out in the backyard. And part of it may be because I've been more active that I'm noticing it more, but certainly I've noticed, you know, other people within the sort of birding community saying, oh, I'm, I'm talking to this newspaper, I'm speaking to that radio, which didn't see as much in the past. So I, I do feel that there's um, a bigger connection than there has been previously. I think uh, one big difference that, that America and Europe would have over the, over the um, Australia in terms of, of backyard birding is the feeding. There's a lot less feeding done in, in Australia and, and primarily it's the nature of the birds. I mean, for example, you put a feeder up and, and you get, you know, cardinals and, and blue jays and goldfinches and, and all these gorgeous little dainty birds. We put a feeder up, we get cockatoos and then they they rip your guttering out and they uh, decide to take the seal out of your window and stuff. So so it's, it's like, and plus a lot of our birds are either, they, you know, they're nectar feeders and it's, yeah. it's, it's harder to sort of, Feed, feed those and um and things like that so there's there's differences here but i would say definitely um the interest has has, has increased yeah so did you know uh, we're having our great backyard bird count this weekend in the united states so if anybody's been listening to the birds in the background and birding by ear send me a list and i'll i'll submit it um so australian birds you mentioned some are super exotic to americans and animals in general, but your birds like cockatoos, rainbow lorikeets, etc. Um, are there any birds that Australians or you would consider exotic that we have? Absolutely. I mean, I could wax lyrical. I'd, I'd say every single one. But you know, if if um, and it's one of the I guess as, as a roll into the, to this question, one of the, the beauties of the group is reminding people that what you think of as boring and familiar for someone else is phenomenal. I mean, I get rainbow lorikeets every day. They shoot around and they squawk and um i take them for granted and yet you know people in other parts of the world look at this incredible rainbow colored parrot and they just think wow and 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 i do the same same with the us i mean in terms of what birds do you have we don't there are loads i mean i'd say anyone who's ever looked on a an american wood duck or a hooded merganser i mean they're the they're the most beautiful wildfowl in the in the world they're they're, they're just just stunning um you know, roadrunners. As, as a kid brought up on Wiley Coyote, the idea that you have real roadrunners in your country is just phenomenal. I mean, condors, you know, the, the biggest birds in the world flying, flying the skies of California. Um, puffins, I mean, they, they're they just wonderful. And again, I was very lucky on my, my visit to California last year that I got out to the Faroe Islands and um, uh, got to see my first tufted puffin. I mean, such a charismatic little bird, but Probably, if I had to pick a couple of families, there are no woodpeckers in Australia, and there are no hummingbirds, and they're such enigmatic bird families. And, and you know, having having something that can drill these enormous holes in the in the trees, like like the woodpeckers do, or the the, the acorn woodpeckers when they're getting all their acorns and they're sticking them in the in the trunks and storing yeah. them for winter. I mean, that's phenomenal. And, and watching a hummingbird fly, and it's it's like a, a, a mini drone. It, it, it goes up and down and backwards and, and, and how the colors change in the sunlight. I mean, we, yes, we have wonderful birds in Australia, but you have wonderful birds in California too. And, um, you know, we're, we're just as jealous of what you've got as, as you are of, 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 what, of what we've got. Okay. So earlier you mentioned um, that it was Africa week this week. So mm -hmm. um, 
I have here something you posted recently. Uh, you know, Africa Week is going well when someone at the British Embassy in Angola direct messages you with a compound list. Um, so that, that's pretty amazing. That was talking about the connections we've made. Um, tell us more about some of the events, kind of events that we do on Bird the Feck at Home, like the uh, competitions and the weeks and... Yeah, so um, obviously the, the, the core thing's adding, adding new birds, but once you've added a morning dove, no one else can add a morning dove. So we want to keep people engaged um, and keep people happy. So I guess one of, one of the big things we've done, um, several of, um, they're exhausting for the admin, so we don't do them more but um we've done what we call big days so for the, the non-birders on, on the on the event today a big day is basically where you go out and you try and find as many different birds as you possibly can um in the one day um so we've done these big sundays um around the world and we basically say to everyone right we've got a, a clean slate everyone go out and find whatever you can and um, we'll see how many birds we can find. And I think the best we've done in 24 hours is 1,400 and some, I can't remember exactly, but it's over 1,400 species, which considering when I set this up, we were hoping for a thousand in the whole event Total. To, to, to sort of smash that by 40% in one 24 hour period. Um, and sometimes we did it fun, like we divided up the, um, the two hemispheres, East and the West. So we had team East versus team West, which was sort of essentially the Americas fighting Australia was from the from the core membership, but um, it was great fun because we drew drew a line right down the middle of the UK. So you know, depending on if you if you lived in in you know Cornwall, you were you were on Team East, but if you, if you uh, Team West, sorry, my geography's been terrible there. But if you lived in North, you're on you're on a Team East. So it, it was that that was good. We we've also introduced um, we had some some fun votes. Um, we call survival of the feckers so what we did is to, to, to sort of celebrate some of the the incredible birds that that we've added and a good way of reminding people of, of what they've achieved because it's it's them that found these birds not me um we sort of had various rounds of votes we did uh, a, a huge vote um going back quite a few months now where um it we uh, had a, a final that basically became the cassowary against the kiwi but i'd always promised that if we found the shoe bill that we mentioned before it would get a bite at the final um never believed it would happen and then in a utterly um incriminating but completely coincidental timing we got a shoe bill on the day of the final so the shoe bill came in it won the vote and uh you know it caused lots of controversy and um heated debate but the great thing is people still talk about it now a year later and if it had been a a plain old boring um, vanilla vote, uh, we, we probably would have long forgotten about it. We also had a, a big vote to celebrate the the songbirds and, and the lyrebird, which um, uh, one of the largest songbirds out there, an Australian songbird that looks like a pheasant and um, that has the most amazing vocal capacity, won that won that round. And um, uh, we, um, we we have little little votes. Another another nice thing we've sort of done is sort of talking talking of events is um, people of a uh, given in their artwork um, and then one of the the admin um, Peter sort of uploaded this all onto a red, red bubble store and we've been selling um, just just fun t-shirt stickers mugs you name it um, branded with the, the sort of bird the fact at home um, and some some fantastic artwork sent in and every single penny that we've we've done from that's gone or, or going to, to bird life international um, and we've raised sort of a bit over a thousand dollars now so um it's been nice to be able to give something back from what from what we've done but all, all these things have they've all been organic none of it was planned and, and none of none of these big days or votes or artwork were my ideas they were they were either admin ideas or membership ideas and, and that's been the beauty of the group it's it's been quite anarchic um and um and then that was the core um Mantra in the early days, it was good natured anarchy was what we were aiming for, um, and uh, you know not not to be stifled by anything. So so any anybody who's listening who's got an, a, a good idea for another event, you know, let us know because because uh, um, you know we're always looking for new ideas for, of engaging more people within the group and, and getting more people to sort of 
take part and, and feel that they're, they're they're part of what we're doing. So, is there a bird out there that we haven't seen yet that could knock King Shoebill off his throne? <sighs> well, invisible rail. Sorry, invisible rail could be one. There's, there's a, we, we've had the inaccessible rail. There's the invisible rail, which from the name will tell you how often it's seen. Um, we do have members who have. Is it sorry. real? It's not mythical. Um, it's real. Someone's posted a photo of one, but sadly from from a couple of years ago when they're on holiday. So it's either very good Photoshop or it's real. Um, you know, we, we've had harpy eagles, cassowaries, um, the night parrot, um, which is, you know, hadn't been seen for, uh, you know, almost a century until it was rediscovered a few years ago. And luckily we connected with a scientist who was living up in the, the, the reserve at the time. So we've had a few... Um, few other birds that are up there with with shoebill um in terms of what else um the northern cassowary um deep in the you know a a, a, a bird capable of killing you from deep in the forest of um papua new guinea would be an absolutely phenomenal new one to add but um one of the nice things about the list is it's it's there's this leveling in democracy that however good a bird is so like emperor penguin we, you know we've, we've we've had scientists in the antarctic take part it's still only worth one point on the um on the list the same as a house sparrow so there's um there's a little bit of a sort of equality there that i quite like but at the, the, for one people say what's the next best bird i say whatever's the next bird we add you know it's sort of uh there's so many great things out there um Philippine eagle would be would be another one that would blow my mind that we, we haven't got yet sort of you know so many things yep so um, we're not going to be birding the feck at home forever are you going to just stop the group when we all go back to normal post-covid or what do you envision um let's see if that's a question I get asked a lot um firstly in one way I wish the group never existed in the first place because you know the circumstances of the last year haven't been great um but now it does exist i'd be sad for it to just disappear i mean for me we've created this lovely community and we've we've connected some truly wonderful people from all across the planet um and there's always going to be a place in the world where we're going to celebrate the the ultra local i think that even when the pandemic's gone and we can we can travel people are still going to enjoy the birds in their backyard and, and the, the birds at the bottom of their street and for me that's probably what we'll morph into we'll we'll, we'll be we'll, it'll be a less in, intense group um i think it'll be it'll be nice for somewhere that we can all still hang out because we were all there together during the pandemic and i, I envisage that there's there's life beyond the, the pandemic and i very much look forward to that happening because quite frankly we're all fed up with the pandemic and uh you know we, we'd all much rather be sort of free and healthy, healthy around the world. But I think it will be, it will be a shame to sort of switch it off completely and kind of go, yep, yeah, done that, been there, goodbye. It'd be more, make it uh, a quieter drop in place where people can come and go as they please, and that pick friendships that have been made can can stay in touch. And you know, that, that's probably where where I hope it it would it would go, um, but. You know the whole thing's been organic and an evolution so far so who knows what the next twist or turn around the corner is so is there a question that you have never been asked but you've always wanted to be asked mm, that is the question i've never been asked um i'm not sure i mean the, the question that hadn't been asked that you, you did already ask that i was glad was sort of asking about all the other people that helped make this this group tick well. Um, I guess, you know, a, a question on, I've always thought about a question on if, if I could sort of travel at the end of this to, to sort of follow up, um, bird the feck at home, where would I go and, and what would I want to see? And that, that's something that that's, I don't know quite what the answer is now, but I do have this kind of, you know, this wonderful idea in my head that would never happen in reality. You know, the the pandemic's gone, and now I can actually get in a plane and and go and visit the the wonderful birding community in Belize or the amazing backyard 
up in North Queensland, um, Alan Shethers, where, where he sort of he just added dozens and dozens of birds to our list or, or you know, get, get on that boat and get to Tristan de Kuna, visit the, the, the hermit in Bhutan who lives with these amazing, incredibly rare pheasants called Satir Tragopans, which um, he, he's obviously not on Facebook being, being a hermit, but he knows one of the guides up there. And the guide sent me a photo of this little guy who lives on the top of a mountain surrounded by these just ama amazing birds. And, and you know, there's a little bit of me that, that, that loves the idea of bird the feck away in that sense at the end of all this and, and, uh, and, and, and seeing some of these things for real because it, virtual is, is a wonderful thing in, in particularly in these times, but it's not a patch on actually, you know, meeting people face to face and, and, and getting out to all these places around the world. And, and um, I've done a huge injustice to thousands of people in hundreds of countries by only singling out a few places that sort of jumped up to my head then because um you know it's um that 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 that's the sort of question of um you know I guess the limitations of what a, a Facebook group can do versus versus the sort of the reality of being out there with real people um in the real world in in this post-pandemic utopia that we're all looking forward to <laughs> So it's been so wonderful talking to you. I think we could talk all day about birds and bird the feck at home. Um, I think you and the admin have just done such a phenomenal job with this group, but I wanna make sure that there's time. Hi, I think you've gone on mute oh. for a second there. Hey, Cynthia, I think we've lost your audio, but I think that's okay if we were, we we're just about to transition to uh, some questions. So let's see, we've got a couple great questions here um, in the Q&A. So let me pull these up. First of all, we had a comment that was just, um, hey, Ed, thanks for being here. Um, hashtag Team Shoebill, which I think you mentioned the Shoebill earlier. <laughs> uh, let's see, is there an easy way to learn bird songs in order to identify birds that are unseen but heard? Is there an easy way? Well, um i'd say what what there's there's two two ways um, i would go about it first of all if you can follow up on that the best way of learning a bird song is if you hear that song try and hone in on it and and follow it up if you if you can get to close to the bird without you know just dis disturbing it or, or or causing damage the second thing would be to listen get hold of them um, uh, most apps these days and, and america's got you know absolute fantastic resources compared to the rest of the world for for, for birding um sort of find out what birds are in your area and then listen to the calls and try and try and um l learn the common ones and i think that that's the thing is if the more you get familiar with then the other ones will stand out and then if you can follow up on them and focus on them then you can slowly learn and learn and learn and it's um it's never an easy thing um Birding by ear is definitely harder than birding by sight, but it opens up so much more. You see so many more. Sorry, you don't see. You you record or, mm -hmm. or observe so many more bird species by knowing what you can hear um, as well as what you can see. Yeah, that well, that was a that's a great starting point. Um, I've been hearing some just out my window as you're <laughs> talking as well. Um, this one, oh, a more technical question. Um, does one need to be on Facebook to join the group? Um, is Bird the Fuck at Home like pretty much exclusively on Facebook? It, unfortunately, just because you know it, it's organic and um, it, it is on Facebook, but you can add records through friends who are on there. So some some of the records we've got are from people who are not on Facebook, but they're a relative of someone in the group or something. We we are on Twitter um, with the handle at Feckbird. But um, it's a it's a light touch. It's not where it's all happening. It's more, you know, we might announce the the, the big findings or you know the the shoe bills and the the four out four thousand bird and things like that. But um, sadly, we're sort of we are primarily a face, Facebook group in that sense. Okay, so Facebook's that main community hub. Mm, for yeah. Sure. Okay. Someone else made sure to mention um also the fun competitions um and threads. Um, on Bird the Fuck at Home, which I think you mentioned on um, the Fake Sundays. Um, they wanted to add that many will say um, Bird the Fuck at Home has been a savior. Uh, someone oh, wanted to ask, 
what's your favorite bird from your childhood? From my childhood, um, the, the red-billed chuff, I think. Uh, again, it's really hard to say what's my favorite because there are dozens. Um, but I think overall, um, the red-billed chuff, which is a, um, a rare, or certainly rare in the UK, um, crow. Now, crows aren't often people's favorite birds particularly but this this is a, a a wonderful one it has it's this beautiful you know satin black mid-sized crow with this curved bright red beak and bright red legs it's really elegant and when I was a kid um we spent most of our um school holidays up in the north west of Wales on the Fleen Peninsula um which is one of the most beautiful places on earth um and um we would um you know go on lovely walks in the area and, and nature walks and we had these really special crows the chuffs that um at the time were incredibly endangered they'd gone extinct in england and they were clinging on um to a, a few sort of westerly coastal areas primarily islands um on the west coast of of wales um and i think there was probably only about 30 to 40 pairs left in the whole country and we had about 20 of them just outside my grandma's house and but not just the rarity but it's their personalities they are so playful they're so tame relatively compared to a lot of birds you know you, you can walk right up to them and they do these cartwheels and somersaults through the sky and they just seem like they really enjoy life and even though they were sort of at the time sort of tittering on the verge of extinction here were these here were these cool little dudes out in the field absolutely just loving life and um you know I, I think if I had to pick one from, from my childhood that was probably it because you kind of you know my mum and dad taught me that it was pretty exclusive and special to see them and you know so you had that kind of the star quality but just it was beyond that it was just the the personalities and and the good thing is now that they're, they're doing a lot better and um they've re-established themselves in in parts of England now and, and the population in Wales is a lot healthier so um it's a, a happy story that um that they're sort of getting commoner and um hope losing losing a bit of their style quality perhaps but in in a good way yeah well it does sound magical I'm gonna have to look those up now there it sounds a bit different from the crows that I have lingering outside <laughs> See another question. Um, just about the the group. Um, does everyone who spots a new a new bird need to post a photo of it to show that they saw it? No, and and one of the things that um we've been keen on is we want to keep it accessible to everyone. And and bearing in mind we've got members from across the globe, and they come from all sorts of different walks of life, socioeconomic backgrounds, community. That you know, as long as someone can can ID the bird and know what they're seeing you, you don't need you don't need fancy photographic equipment we we run on trust you know um it's just a bit of fun um and 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 you know we love photos it's a great way of sharing on the group what something looks like but if if someone doesn't have a camera because either they they just don't photog photograph or they can't afford it it's the bird still counts there's no um we, we we want it as accessible as, as possible and um you know uh for us it, there are groups where you know they're very strict and it has to be you know the photographs there but that, that's not something that we we have ever required i personally very rarely take photos myself so um you know i, I wasn't coming from a, a bird photography background in, in that sense and uh you know whilst we love the photos yeah, now if you see it, that, that's good enough for us. Or even if you hear it, you don't even have to see it. Oh, okay, so bring it in. If you hear the bird song and you can identify yeah. it, then that yeah. counts. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen the cassowary in Australia? Yeah, I've been lucky lucky enough. Um, probably, I mean, it, they live right the other end of Australia. So it's, you know, in terms of the distances, it's... um probably from where you are it's like the nearest cassowary would be in Maine or something like that but um uh wow, it's right, right, so quite right, far. right the way up in the, the, the north it's a, it's a tropical rainforest bird um I've been lucky enough um I've seen them I think three three times yeah um the the, the funniest time was there's a 
a, a beautiful beach called Etty Bay, um, which is famous for its um, quite tame cassowaries. And uh, um, they walk, walk up and down the beach. So it's a, you know, almost a cliche Australian um, image of this beautiful tropical beach with uh, the, the rainforest mountains behind and, and the palm trees lining it. And then walking up and down the beach is, is this, this, this cassowary. I think that there may be a couple of them there, but it's, it's a great place to see them. And it's also a touristy spot. It's, it's a lovely spot. And so there was this um, cassowary wandering up the beach and uh, a whole um, swathe of general tourists. I don't think that there were, I mean, there was me and a couple of, couple of other birders there, but you know, probably about 20 people all with their cameras and their video cameras following from a safe distance, this cassowary, because you know, they, they can kill you. They, 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 their threat gets exaggerated oh. at the same time. At the same time, you don't want to mess with them. Um, so there's this whole, there's the paparazzi in, in their, you know, board <laughs> shorts and t-shirts following. And there's this, there's this um, young lady fast asleep on the beach, um, sunbathing um, in a bikini, just, you know, bags out, umbrella up, sort of just enjoying the, the beach. And this cassowary is creeping closer and closer to her. And it eventually, it obviously sees something it wants to eat. Um, and it sort of leans over and it, it pecks and then it pulls hold of a towel and starts pulling the towel. She looks up, sees this cassowary screams. She then turns around and sees all the paparazzi taking photographs of the cassowary <laughs> and, her, and she screams again. And it was just sort yeah. of, um, you know, that, that, that was, I think that was the first, first time I saw a cassowary. And I think, um, you know, it wasn't probably a typical uh, cassowary hiding in the rainforest, but it was certainly yeah. a, a funny moment for, Probably everyone except except the girl sunbathing. She perhaps didn't didn't, didn't enjoy it as much, but uh, you know it was a um, sort of a, a nice sort of cliche of Australia there for, for for all the American audience. Definitely made an impression for sure. <laughs> well, so that would be a yes, definite yes. Yes. To that question. Yes. All right. Now, oh, shifting to your book collection behind you. Um, someone commented you have quite a collection of field guides and very interesting books. Are you an ornithologist, biologist, um, et cetera, as well as a birder as an avocation? Uh, I'm a complete book nerd. I think I, I'm, I'm sort of sort of got my, my my bird and wildlife books on that side, and then the there's history and uh, uh, you know, Terry Pratchett and various other things on on that side. Now I'm just I'm I'm a a, a terrible hoarder of books, but no. My, um, I'm not a an ornithologist by by trade. I'm actually an accountant. So, you know, the the spreadsheet that we keep all the the, the, the birds from the Fecker home on, you know, that, that's where my skill set lies. But um, uh, no, in terms of um, a proper ornithologist, you know, they are far cleverer than me. And um, you know, no, I just uh, I just have I just have the books. <laughs> Well, you're in the perfect place at a library program. Uh, we also all have a ton of books as well. Mm. Um, someone else uh, wanted to let you know um, that Bird the Feck at Home has been a real positive through this difficult time. Um, they've learned so much and now even have a birding pin pal. Excellent. That's, uh, that's, that's really nice to hear. That's cool. That's been, a, re a, bit that's been a really nice thing because everyone's, you know, the people have connected and it's, it's been really nice that, you know, friendships have been made in the group from from across the globe really so that's been a real positive yeah uh, like overall it seems like this is an amazing group um we have a couple thanks as well let's see and it looks like that's it for questions um yeah so if you want to find bird the Peck at home it's on facebook um if you're watching on the library um then you can just follow we have the hashtag for it up there as well um yeah, is there anything you want to add to finish up, Ed? Not really, other than um, thanks to everyone in the audience who's joined it and been part of it. If anyone else uh, is interested, do do check us out on on Facebook, Bird the Feck at Home. It's a it's a fun community there. Um, you don't have to be a bird expert. In fact, probably one of the nicest things in a way that you know, if I sort of said, you know, what was some of the best things is actually people who are on there who say, I'm not a bird or I don't know anything about birds, but this is one of my favorite places on Facebook because it's just a fun place to be. And, and, and that's, that's what, what we want, because if we can spread that kind of bird nerd joy to people who aren't traditionally birders, then 
that's a win. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's been a positive in 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 a bad year and it has been a bit great distraction. And I just want to, before I go, just say a big thanks to everyone who's been a part of it, to, to the admin and to the members and to the, the people who've, you know, come up with the ideas and, and given us the birds. It's been so much fun, but also we've still got around about... 5,700 birds to find. So if anyone knows anyone in the Pantanal or, you know, down in Bouvet Island or, you know, in Siberia, please invite them along because, uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've still got thousands to go. <laughs> I'm greedy. <laughs> well, you'll get them all one day. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, that's it for our program today. Um, if you're interested in further nature related programs on March 18th, uh, we have another event, which is connecting with nature in a pandemic. So a bit of an extension from birds um, to nature in general. Uh, so thank you everyone very much for joining us. Thanks very much.